Welcome everyone. I hope everyone is doing well. I'm recovering from the flu. This is why I have my Bitcoin scarf on. So let's get right into the mix of things. I have some thoughts and concerns, a review, if you may say, from a stake pool operator side. We've been operating two pools. We just opened up our second pool. Our pools are SCAR and SCAR2, S-C-A-R. And SCAR has been running for the duration of the testnet, the incentivized testnet. And I wanted to provide a discussion about the economic model for stake pool operators and how I don't think it's viable moving forward. Our pool is not going anywhere. We're here for the long run. But I just wanted to talk about the greater incentive for stake pool operators to run successful, sustainable businesses within the Cardano ecosystem. What I've noticed is we've diverged from free market capitalism to this more egalitarian type model. But there are contradictions in creating this business model and there are also ramifications moving forward if we're going to choose this business model let's say 5, 10, 15, 20 years in the future, especially when the bigger players start coming in and playing. We're talking about the exchanges, Binance, Bittrex. We're talking about Coinbase and various other exchanges that are going to be able to outpower and outmaneuver a lot of these stake pool operators. So what exactly am I talking about? What are my qualms with what's going on right now? What am I talking about this economic model? First of all, I'd like to preface this by saying that I'm not an economist by trade. I just am looking at the numbers of our pool and this is my conclusion. So if you're a stake pool operator and you disagree with me, it is what it is. If you're a delegator and you think that I'm talking out the side of my neck, it is what it is as well. But I look at the numbers and this is what it's telling me. As a business owner, as a stake pool operator, we are trying to create a sustainable business and it doesn't seem like it's sustainable. So let us talk about it. And what do I mean when I say sustainable business? I know this is the bear market. I'm not expecting stake pool operators to make bank or create this sort of overnight successful business. Not, what, not that whatsoever. But when the return percentage, when you can, when you can put the comparison of certain delegators return percentage and the operators return percentage in relatively the same bubble, then you have a problem. What incentivizes the operator to continue moving with the same veracity that they were moving at the beginning of the incentivized testnet? The first thing we're going to be talking about today is saturation point. Saturation point is this number that's put into effect. It's 1% of the total delegated stake. And it basically says that this is the max cap that eight of delegated ADA that any one particular pool should have at any one particular point of time. And once you pass that, proportionately, the number of rewards or the amount of rewards that go to the individual delegators gets decreased. So after you hit that saturation point, there's no incentive for any pool to take any additional ADA. Your, your rewards are capped and there's just so much that you can make. So that really de-incentivizes pools to continue pushing, 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 pushing forward. What it does is it creates bloat. Let me explain. The majority or a lot of successful pool operators are creating multiple pools. There's even a pool operator that has, I don't know, 26, 36 pools that, is, that are registered. I'm not here to name any pools, but this is what happens. People are saying that it decentralizes the protocol. I see just a couple of owners owning a ton of pools. We own two pools ourselves. So is it really that we have so many pools that are operating successfully within the ITN? Or is it just a couple people, a handful of people that are running multiple, 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 multiple pools? You know, that's, a, that's the debate. So if that's, if that's what decentralized means, then, you know, I, it's a synonymous with bloat. It's uh, quantity over quality. If, if may, but I can't fault the pool operators because if there's a saturation point, why would you go over and beyond for that one particular pool when you can just spit up another one? So there have been arguments made that 
how is this going to be mitigated in the future? There's something called a pledge that's coming out. So owners are going to have to pledge certain amounts. So the owner's pledge or let's say the owner's, let's, let's call it like the owner's retained earnings or the owner's pledge, the amount of ADA that the owner puts up is going to directly it's going to be proportional to the number of blocks that they receive in the future so if you do not put a lot of pledge if you're just spinning up 30 40 50 pools you're going to have to significantly fund those pools in order for you to even have a chance to win blocks so i'm not 100 percent sure which way we're going on one end we say we want to decentralize the network in the maximum way possible like we want to make sure that everyone can run a node Anyone can run a stake pool. If you have a rock pie in the middle of nowhere, you can run a stake pool. And then on the other side, you're saying that, but you're going to have to make sure you have the pledge requirements in order to even successfully run a block. So which one is it? You're capping productivity on one end from stake pool operators that are running, trying to run a business. And on the other end, you know, you're this, you're, you're disenfranchising people from actually trying to create their own pool. So you can't have both, they, they negate each other. I don't really have that many thoughts about pledge, but you cannot tell me that you're gonna max salary cap the, the pool operators on one side, and then on the other side, you're going to make sure that you prevent everyone from coming in. Which one is it? I mean, I'm fine with the pledge. Put your money where your mouth is, it's fine. I understand that, I understand that. I have a problem with the saturation point. I think it should be removed. I think that owners should be able to focus on one pool and make that pool the best possible pool that they can. In effect, right now, what it is, it's just it's just bloat right now. It's very analogous to the NBA, and I'm going to switch gears now. The NBA is the National Basketball Association, and I've been looking at other economic models that are similar to where Cardano is going and seeing whether or not it is truly decentralized. Let's call the owners the pool operators in this sense. Uh, for each team, everyone has a salary cap set by the NBA. So that's the maximum amount of money that any particular team can spend. And this is supposed to level the playing field. So if you have a multi-billionaire who is running the Golden State Warriors or the Los Angeles Lakers, they are competing on a similar playing field than a smaller market team like, I don't know, the Memphis Grizzlies. And what do I mean by smaller market teams? There are a few teams in the NBA that command larger audiences, have bigger stadiums, have bigger draw. I mean, you have the New York Knicks, you have the Boston Celtics, you have the Los Angeles Lakers. Maybe you can throw in the Miami Heat there, but those big market cities that you know you're going to probably fill up the the arena every night for a season game or something like that if you have a star player because there are just that many people. But if you go to a small market, you may not have that, that draw, if that makes any sense. So, and there's different levels of rich in the NBA for owners. I mean, there's multi-billionaire owners and there's not billionaire owners. So you have to figure out exactly where that sweet spot is. So they have that, and then they also have a minimum salary that they, they can pay NBA players. So that's, uh, that's mandated by the NBA. But what happens is for these smaller market teams, that, that can be considered a pledge amount, while the Lakers can just sign a whole bunch of different people to salary minimums because it doesn't really affect their bottom line. They can break even at the end of the season, and they're not going to, or they can generate 1% return there are other teams that need to generate profit. They have empty seats throughout the season. They don't have the revenue. They don't have the cash flow. They don't have the liquidity to sign a whole bunch of salaries or minimum salaries to players that may aid their franchise in the future. Everything has to be calculative. They cannot waste a single dollar. Other more expensive teams, other more high commanding teams, high profile teams, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't really matter. What's another 500,000? What's another million? Doesn't really matter. At the end of the day, these two, these two, these minimum salary and the, the, the salary cap, they're all I mean, like ultimately like the pledge and the saturation point in Cardano. And now I ask myself, has that done anything? Has that done 
what it was supposed to do. What, what was the effect of that? It was supposed to decentralize talent or decentralize, just create this decentralized web for NBA. It has it decentralized talent. Absolutely not. The same people are on the same teams. There are only a few super teams, you know, maybe a couple, you know, there, there are only two or three, maybe four max that are, have a chance of making it to the finals. The rest are bloat. You know, I'm not saying that they're not talented. They are talented, but the gap between certain teams is just, is astronomical. At the end of the day, LeBron James is going to go to the Lakers. Kawhi Leonard is going to go to the Clippers. They have their supporting cast. And then everyone in between, it's just, it's just a fight. So I don't know. I mean, I'm sure, of course there's talent otherwhere, but in other markets, but the same teams, the same NBA teams are winning the championships each year. You know, it's a, the Celtics have the most championships, the Lakers, you know, the New York Knicks. It's just a handful of teams that have won the NBA champion. It's not, it's not decentralized whatsoever. It's not like power has been shared amongst the 32 NBA teams. Nope, it has not happened. So why, why, and you have anomalies, you know, the only reason why small markets teams would actually even win the NBA championship like, for example, let's say the Cleveland Cavaliers is because LeBron James went back to Cleveland by choice because that's where he was from. He would have never gone to a small market team like Cleveland if he wasn't from Cleveland. And that's the only reason why they won a championship. And it's probably the only championship that they're going to win for the foreseeable future. Unless something crazy happens. Who knows? But uh, that's what happens. So I digress. So basically what I'm saying is remove the saturation point. Let the free market work itself. You know, are we moving towards free market capitalism or are we trying to create this egalitarianism model, which is just going to de-incentivize business owners and de-incentivize stake pool operators to run sustainable businesses in the future. In the end of the day, it's just going to be, it, it's, it's not going to decentralize anything. And we're just going to be staking with Binance, Bittrex, and Coinbase. Delegators who are delegating to low percentage pools, they, I mean, you're not necessarily making more. And it's fine. It is fine. You do what's in your best self-interest. So why can delegators do what's in their best self-interest and navigate the, free mar navigate the free market and stake pool operators cannot operate on the same playing field? Does not make sense. Another thing is... As a state pool operator, I've had issues with these adversarial forkers. So at this point, there's a protocol issue because it has not been fixed. And I think it's very disingenuous from, I mean, the fact that it wasn't built into the system, it is what it is. But at this point, everyone's money is being played with. I mean, you have operators who are adversarial, uh, adversarially forking the network which is decreasing the chances for other operators to successfully win blocks and ultimately just destroying the network, clogging the network, creating all these runaway forks. And it's, it's, it's asinine. It's asinine. At the end of the day, if you go up to an ATM machine and it gives you an extra $100 and you know there's an issue with the ATM machine because you only took out 100 and it gave you 200 at what point does it become stealing? When you know there's a problem and you willingly continue to hit that jackpot button, at what pro point? And that's that's a that's not you know that's a morality question for each individual person. And people are gonna say it's a test net, it's a test net. This is why it's a test net. No, it's not a test net anymore. I mean, it is considered a test net, but at the end of the day, real money is going to be earned here. So you're playing with real money. So these problems, we can't be using this as an excuse anymore. Things are either going to fall down this path or they're going to have to change over time. You know, the pledge is supposed to be implemented at some sort of point. What's the use? Why, why, wait? why wait any longer? Just implement it now. Or if this is going to be implemented, implement it now. Because every single day, money is exchanged and it's not realized yet, but eventually it will be. Let the free market rule how stake pool operators create sustainable businesses. Give people the incentives to run legitimate businesses. Don't cap profits. Don't cap this. Don't, don't cap that. 
whether or not these changes get implemented, it is what it is. Scar, Scar 2, we're here to stay and we're just going to have to maneuver as the test net changes and as time progresses. So I hope everyone has a wonderful day and until the next video. All right. Bye, everyone.